It's hard for people to make sense of suicide. It's hard to make pe for people to make sense of psychiatric problems in general if they've never endured it. The tremendous psych ache that you feel, the, the lethargy, the just the, the hopelessness, and for some, feeling of burdensomeness, that I'm a burden to my family, and the feeling of thwarted belongingness, that I don't belong to any, any group. To feel that isolated, burdensome, and just excruciating pain with no pleasure, I can imagine that that is something that it's almost scary to want to fathom what that would be like for people who've never been around it or experienced it. So to then make sense of the suicide that might ensue from that is almost unfathomable. We have, you know, 40,000 suicides a year uh, in this country. And, um, you know, it's the third leading cause of death for young people. For some people who get judgmental, it's partly fear. They don't know what to make of it. And, uh, they don't ask enough questions to get a better understanding of it. So when I was 17 years old, I discovered when my parents called us down to, my sister and I came down to a family meeting that my father's father had killed himself when my dad was 17 years of age. They waited till I was a, a later adolescent to tell myself and my sister. It was shocking. Uh, I remember having a terrible time trying to make sense of it. And my father, who was a mental health professional, had a lot of time, had a lot of difficulty actually talking about his own emotional reactions to it. So it was a hard thing for a teenager to, to make sense of. Um, but somehow, in my mind, I just had this intense curiosity and concern and, and seeing what effect it had, or learning what effect it had on my father. When I went to college, I majored in psychology and um, when an opportunity arose to direct a clinic for suicidal and depressed teenagers in the Bronx, I seized that opportunity and I really wanted to study how do we, how do we assess risk and how do we treat suicidal behavior in adolescents. There was not a single evidence-based treatment developed for suicidal youth. That's when we came upon dialectical behavior therapy that Marshall Linehan had developed for suicidal adults. And when we looked at it, it seemed to map on so perfectly for multi-problem teenagers. My colleague Jill Rathis and I decided, we know as, clini as clinicians, as psychologists, this treatment makes sense. How does it make sense? Individual therapy that is balanced with this notion of validation that Linehan took from her Eastern kind of meditation practices coupled with cognitive behavioral principles of change. And, and many of the patients who are very emotionally vulnerable have a lot of difficulty feeling judged and unaccepted, feeling inadequate even as patients to do a, a good job as a patient and change their thinking and behavior. And when Linehan first started doing CBT alone, it backfired completely. They felt like the therapist didn't understand how difficult it is to change that you should just snap your fingers and make these things happen. So that's when she wove in this mindfulness and acceptance piece to help the patients feel that they were understood by the therapist and then for the patients or clients to be more accepting and tolerant of themselves during the process of change. It is, is beyond, it's awareness, it's attentional control, and it's kind of being in this moment. And it is it has changed lives. Those skill sets in and of themselves are life-changing. So one of the, the things I love about teaching mindfulness to teenagers is if I drew an X and Y axis, I say, you guys notice you're distressed after you punched the wall or cursed out your teacher. But what if you could begin to notice at zero to five miles per hour, your fist starting to clench or your, or your jaw is tight and then you notice I'm having the thought that I want to curse out my teacher. That's different than cursing out your teacher. You're just noticing the thought that. As we started working with adolescents and families, we recognized that, not surprisingly to many people, teenagers and parents stand on opposite sides of the Grand Canyon and have trouble navigating, you know, getting to some middle area. They say black, they say white. They say up, the teenager says down. It's not either you're right and I'm, or I'm wrong. It's both you have some wisdom in your perspective and at the same time I have some wisdom in mine and can we hold these perspectives together. 
to be able to then move toward the middle. And the kids are going to more likely to get there and move towards the parents, at least toward the middle, if they feel understood. But when you don't feel understood, and it's just my way or the highway, well, we know how that turns out typically. So there's a whole set of walking the middle path skills that we developed. But the other pieces of DBT that I find are very useful are, number, so the individual therapy, their skills training. The third part of it is coaching. How do you positively reinforce behaviors that you want to see in the other person? And I think as a parent, and many parents can relate to this, you just expect your kid to be able to do certain things. And at a certain point, we stop saying, hey, good job. But for people who are struggling and, and adding new behaviors to their repertoire, we got to be on that like a coach and say, that's exactly it, man. That's it. High five. Good job. I love that right there. If they could do better, they would. So we're going to teach them skills and then coach them when they need coaching, whether it be two in the morning or, you know, 8, 8 a.m. before school or on the weekends. But it's so rewarding to be able to talk to a kid in real time when the shit hits the fan versus w uh, waiting till two in the morning and I hear from the ER doctor, I have your patient here, they just overdosed. So this mimics more real life than some of the more traditional therapies. I will see you next week at this exact time. No, I wanna be able to have real time contact with my clients so I can kind of work with them. But I, what I like about DBT also is that there's a lot of self-involving self self-disclosure. So when you do X, I feel why. Their behavior affects therapists. We're not blank slates like Freud used to say. We actually are human beings that have feelings and have to have a trusting relationship with our clients and vice versa. A part of it is being as radically genuine as we can be and whether it be talking about the fact that I play in a band or that I'm coaching a soccer team or that I'm, so I'm, uh, there's some, some self-disclosure, there's some responses that I'll say to them that I would say to my best friend or you know, my wife that you know, is considered irreverent. I had a teenage girl, one of my early DBT clients, and she was very impulsive, and she'd been in gangs in the Bronx and had definitely assaulted people in her time. And one day she said to me, Alec, I swear to God, if my sister doesn't help me clean up the apartment, I'm gonna cut off her legs and cut out her tongue. And I said, wow, Maria, I guess you're not gonna get any help cleaning up in the future then. And she, she just digested what I said, as opposed to saying, oh, wow, Maria, you sound very, very angry, and just fueling her anger. So sometimes saying things irreverent, offbeat, kind of slightly, uh, you know, catches them off guard, and, and they, they, they respond to that. I mean, I never cease to be amazed. Uh, there's just, I, one of the things that surprises me by some is their impressive resilience. I think there's a certain wisdom that kids have that I, I sometimes would underestimate that they have insight and in, into especially other people, uh, sometimes themselves, more than we give them credit for. And I don't think we have to ask enough, enough questions of them. I think we need to give them a little more credit for how they view the world and their perspective on things. So, But I, I do think, though, even teenagers these days are, are getting more comfortable saying, oh, I was at a psychiatric hospital, I was at this hospital or that hospital. Even in my multifamily groups, I hear them talking much more willingly than they did 20 years ago. And, and I really do feel like the diagnosis of BPD has historically been stigmatized. And with the advent of dialectical behavior therapy, it's helping to destigmatize it because there's actually very good outcomes and it's not a lifelong condition where you sent off to Siberia and you never come back. We can treat these conditions and get these people well again. So maybe before, you know, the, the problems hit in mid to late adolescence, what if we teach our kids life skills in late elementary and middle school, teach them how to be mindful, teach them how to manage their emotions, to tolerate distress. So there's just so many life skills we can take from the DBT package and bring it to schools. I, I am so passionate about um, trying to prevent some of this, um, these issues before they come up.